Now we're going to look at brushes and brush textures and what you can do with brushes. And there are a couple different things that the brushes can do that are a little more than usual. You can use a brush just like a regular old paintbrush and you can paint with paint and you can paint in lots of different sizes with lots of different pressures and lots of different bristles and we'll talk about all those contextual options in a second. So this panel up here, this entire menu will change depending on what brush you choose. You can see that when I change, some of my options change and there are lots of different options that you can find in different uh, brushes. We also talked a little bit before about how you can have brushes that are or are not responsive to your paper texture. You can choose your brushes over here which have a category to one side and a variant to the right. The variant is what you're actually using to paint with and that means all the vari variable types of that kind of item. So for instance right now I'm using charcoal or Conte crayon and there are many different kinds of Conte crayon, there are many different kinds of dull charcoal pencil and someone has already set a whole bunch of options and features to make these things look a little bit different. So the difference between this one right here with a little bit of a soft edge versus this one with a little bit of a hard edge but generally the same texture has already been set in a huge menu of variable items. That way you can go to this menu and choose just from these variants to get some different but mostly common uses of that kind of material or that kind of brush. So all of these, even though some of them are called crayons and pencils, these are all brushes. So there are a couple different ways that you can paint. You can paint in the traditional manner with a brush, just, just painting, I don't have my brush tool. You can paint with a brush, just painting with paint, right? You can paint, do, 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 go, with an oil brush. You can paint with a, br with a brush, just painting regular paint. I've got some weird things going on, so I'm just going to delete this whole extra layer and go back to the canvas. Uh, so you can paint with just a paintbrush. Make that a little smaller. You can paint with just a paintbrush, and it's painting with paint. It's painting with that color that I have right here. And that means that I'm getting a very painty paintbrush feel. Often pushing harder is going to give you more uh, more paint versus less paint when you push lighter. It's also mo a lot of the time speed sensitive. So your grain gets a little less sharp when you go quickly. But this is generally painting with paint. You can also paint with patterns or with images. So if I choose this, I can paint with a pattern or an image and as you can see down here this pattern is already selected in this pattern selected here so I can change this to something else and again I can paint with it and get that pattern again in whatever color I want. Uh, this also responds to speed, pressure, and I can't think of the word I'm looking for. Speed and pressure I guess is all that is. Uh, oh, and direction. So it depends on which direction my pen is pointing, that it'll give me either a straight up and down stamp or something that's skewed one way or another. So you can paint with paint and you can paint with a pattern. I'm going to erase some of these, but not all of them. Okay. So you can paint with pen and you can uh, paint and you can paint with a pattern or a picture. You can also paint with texture. So this is called impasto, and whenever you're painting on a painting and you're really glopping the paint on, uh, what that does is it put it changes the physical surface of your paper. And by using this, I can change the physical surface of the paper. You can see that it seems like it's making a bump in the paper right there. And that is technically what it's doing. Of course, it's not really doing that because this is a digital picture. But the idea is that it's creating a, a surface that's raised right there. So also if I go back to oil paint, cover over that, you can see that I have quite a lump in my paper right here that I've created with my impasto. 
This happens a lot as well when you're using acrylic or certain brushes that are designed with impasto in mind or the idea that you can pile paint on top of itself. There are a couple things, if you want this effect, you can use it, of course. If you don't want this effect, you can always go to Canvas, Clear Impasto to delete it, or Hide Impasto just to make it not visible for the moment. But if there's a lot of it on your paper and you didn't mean for it to be, to be there, you can go ahead and go to Clear Impasto and it'll get rid of it entirely. So you can paint with a regular paintbrush. You can paint with a pattern and you can paint with physical texture. You can also paint with pictures, uh, which is very similar to painting with the pattern. You can paint with effects like a photographer might. So you can paint with blur. And as I paint over this brush stroke, it's just gonna blur those two things together. I can paint with saturation. And as I paint, this part of the image is gonna get more and more saturated because my brush is loaded with saturation. Now these are not realistic things to paint with, but you can paint with them. In addition to being able to paint with pens, pencils, watercolor, oil, all of those kinds of things, you can also paint with things that pretty much don't exist. Again, you can also paint with nothing, and with, by that I mean you can use an eraser, or you can also paint with nothing, and by that I mean a blender. So I can paint with nothing and I can move around the paint that already exists in order to, whoop, let's do coarse smear. And I can smear this and it looks very similar to what the blur did, except if you look very closely at this edge right here, instead of making a nice smooth blur, I have a very patterned blur over here. The idea of the blender is to be able to move two colors together and make them more, um, and make them interact a little bit more. So for instance, just add water. If I zoom out, I'm combining these two colors with the brush texture that I have in hand, and I'm mixing and combining them, very similar to the way we do on the mixer palette. So again, your options are you can paint with paint, you can paint with pictures, you can paint with nothing as in erasing, and you can paint with nothing as in blending, and you can paint with texture. So there's a lot more things than we can paint that we can paint with than just simple paint. So our brushes can be very interesting. Also that means if you're painting and nothing's happening, it might be because you're painting with a blender. It might be because you're painting with a photography brush that doesn't do anything anyway, even though it's in the brush category. And it might mean that you're painting uh, with your eraser, which is pretty common for me. Uh, now, I wanna remind you of a couple shortcuts to do with brushes. Again, B for brush, to pull you back to whatever brush you're using, and I'm gonna go back to a at least somewhat brushable brush, there we go. So, uh, B for brush, and N, which is right next to it, controls your eraser. So you can flip back and forth from your eraser to your pen with the B key for brush, the N key for the eraser. And this is very useful because you can quickly jump back and forth between the two. So you can choose also to erase your whole page or what I've been doing is hitting Control A and Control X to cut. Also, if you hit Control A, you can see this dashed line all the way around my view. If I want that to go away, I can also hit Control D, which is deselect. If you go into the select menu, you can see Control D means select none or deselect. So I'm going to go back to the brush, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the variable menu with your brushes. So anytime you come to a brush, unless it's one of your favorite brushes that you've set up to work in your favorite way, you might want to consider hitting the reset button. So you can tell when you hover over it that this is the reset tool. I'm going to click that. I'm going to reset this brush to its normal size. Um, I forgot to tell you a couple more short keyboard shortcuts. And a couple more things you might want to do to prep your brush before you start working. You want to hold Control and Alt at the same time, push your pen down and slide it up and down to change the size of your brush. Now you can go up here and move it with the size control very commonly, but this is a lot faster and a lot easier to do than for me to go all the way back up here and change it. Also, if you notice, when I grab right here, I can't see what size my brush is really going to be. I have no idea what 750 looks like, and I have no idea what one looks like, or the proportion between the two. 
But you know what I do know what it looks like? When I hold these two buttons down and I slide up and I see that big green circle, I know how big my brush is gonna be. And that is how big I want my brush to be. Or that is how big I want my brush to be. I can see and know how big I want my brush to be. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, Control A, Control X to clear that out for us. Another thing you can do is your bracket, uh, your bracket keys. Uh, they're up in the uh, right hand, hand side of your keyboard. They're below the plus and minus. Uh, they're between the P and the backslash. They're right by the enter. And you press the one on the right to go up in size, like that. Bop, bop, bop. And the one on the left to go down in size like that. And you can do this. Now, if you're going to do that, you're definitely going to want to change this next setting. Preferences. Go to Edit, Preferences performance and oh nope general general edit preferences general and this right here says brush size increment two pixels yours is probably going to say one pixel I want it to say two pixels and the reason that is is because when you press up and down that tells you how much it moves your brush your brush size by if you look up here you're going to see that as I press this it goes up by two at a time instead of one at a time which means I get a much more visible result every time I press that button or even press and hold that button and it gives me a much faster result than, mm, than before. It's, it's very slow when you only have one. So uh, that reset tool is very useful um, and uh, you can change the size of, you, oh, I'm sorry, you can change the size of your brush by Control and Alt. You can change the size of your brush by the bracket tool. And there's one other thing that you should do. And this time, that last one, you only have to do every once in a while. But this setting, you should probably do every time you sit down. Edit Preferences Brush Tracking. And what this will do is it'll sense the pressure that you're putting on the pen and the speed at which you move and reset these items to be for you. If anyone else uses your computer, uh, and resets that calibration and it'll be different and also it'll be different for every person in the room depending on what your mood is. If I'm angry it might be quick and hard and if I'm really really calm or tired that day it might be really meandering and slow. But it will go ahead and change all of these for me so I don't have to worry about what I actually am. This is actually going to read my future and tell me the kind of person that I am. It won't tell you what Harry Potter character you are, but it will tell you how you use your brush and pen tool. So now that we've got that, that out of the way, we're gonna go back to our normal talking about brush and talking about our contextual menu up here. So we have the this first button, which is the reset tool, which is very useful if your brush is doing something weird. Maybe your brush isn't painting. And the reset tool might get your brush back into action because someone might have done something to it. These next two items are how your brush draws. Normally it's gonna be on the freehand stroke side, which allows you to do all sorts of woobly doobly action. Sometimes you're gonna need straight lines, in which case you can do this straight line stroke section. And then every time you click, from that position that you click to, to the next one, it will draw a straight line with that brush. It will hold it straight as a ruler, however many times you want, and every time you click. Now, also, if you're on the freehand stroke, and uh, the freehand stroke button, and you can also turn on the align to path option, which means if you had some sort of path or architecture in here, it would force it to follow that path, which can also be useful. Uh, the next one is going to be your size. Again, although you can change it from this slider, it's very hard to tell what that size is. And I prefer to use Control Alt, make things bigger or smaller, or the bracket keys, which also gives you a visu visual reflection on the screen. The opacity lets you know how thick or thin your paint is. So if I turn this to seven and I put a very light yellow color and then I stroke over this red, I'm getting a mostly transparent color. You see a little bit of white, a little bit of red through it, you're getting a very transparent color. If I bump, bump it back up to 100, I'm going to get a very opaque color, sitting very much right on top of those other colors and not mixing very much at all. This is not physically mixing as if the paint was wet, but going over it as if the paint were glazed. Now the next one is part of our contextual menu features, 
And if there's anything you remember in all of these videos, this is what I want you to remember, okay? Resaturation. Resaturation can turn any brush into a blender. When you have a single brush, it tells you to put a whole lot of paint on your brush. And if you take it all the way down to any percent, even 1%, it still has paint on your brush. Now notice it has a lot less paint on my brush. I start out yellow and I end up just dragging paint around. But I still have yellow on that brush. Even down here, I still have yellow on my brush. A tiny, tiny bit of yellow is being magically recreated. In fact, 1% of yellow is being magically recreated inside my brush every time I move. That's really interesting that became green. Huh. Anyway. If I change it from zero to one, or one to zero, something magical happens. I get no paint, none. Not one little bit of paint on my physical brush. But now it's a blender, and I can make any brush I want a blender. I can now mix these two colors together to my heart's content, and I will never lay down another color. And if you don't believe me, I'm gonna change to blue. Because if I were to lay down any blue right now, you would see it, these are very unblue colors, right? But again, I'm not laying down any. If I change it to 1%, I am going to end up laying down blue. Just a very little blue, and that blue is automatically going to blend with whatever color I'm laying it down on top of, but I am laying down blue. And I'm laying down an infinitely recreating amount of blue. I'm never running out of blue, no matter where I go. It's not like I run out and I have to redip, right? I have 1% of blue in my brush forever and ever. So this is really useful because if it's at zero, you might have a blender brush and that might be your problem. Because if I start with a blank canvas, I, I, can't, I can't paint anything. I'm just blurring white into white. Nothing's happening, nothing. <sighs> so if I'm panicking and I can't get something to paint, it's probably because my resaturation's at zero. If I'm sure, that my brush is a brushy brush and not an image brush or a blender or something like that, I may accidentally have a blender with resaturation. And often, hitting the reset button will fix that. Oh, except that I'm actually painting with white. That's another option. You could be painting with white. I'm going to hit Control V and bring back that mess that I had before. I'm going to hit the B button and bring back the brush that I had before. So let's say our resaturation is at zero. And I'm just blending my heart's content. Now one of the things you want to pay attention to is our next feature, which is bleed. And that is, if you have 100% bleed, you have a really soft, gentle, very nice, pretty blend. It's nice and soft. It's very, very nice. It's very subtle. It's not real aggressive. But like all blending, uh, whenever you touch down with your brush, you're going to start blending that color into the next color. So if I touch down on this red and bleed, blend into this yellow, I am blending red into that yellow. And if I touch down on this yellow and blend into the red, I'm blending that yellow into the red. Now, if I go back and forth, I'm mostly just increasing and decreasing the yellow. I don't tend to get a lot of extra red. As you can see when I bridge that gap right here, if I start in this brown, bleed over the the red into the yellow and back again, I'm going to get predominantly brown. And you can see that, that I'm, I'm getting that and yellow as I'm backstroking with it. Because that red is getting overpowered in the middle of the blend. You can see it happen here, the blue and the, and the red on each side. And even then, I'm getting a lot more blue because that's where I'm touching down. If I go down to zero, my blend is going to be no longer extremely soft. It's going to be extremely hard. It's going to blend almost as if uh, instead of blending with a nice soft brush, I'm blending with a really hard item. So if I start in white, I'm just going to drag that paint all the way across. If I start in blue, I'm going to end up dragging that paint across. And I'm more just dragging the original color than actually blending it with another color. You can see here I picked up a little yellow. And if I keep going, probably pick up another color. Looks like I've got some darker colors in there, though it's hard to tell. Uh, with your blend is at zero, you're getting very, very rough blends. 
So it's good to pay attention to that if you want something really soft like skin or, um, or something like that. You'll probably want to blend with this very soft blender brush, but if it's getting too blended for you and you really want to celebrate those individual colors, you can bring your bleed down and get a better blended mixture that holds some of your colors to be a little bit more, a uh, little bit stronger when they interact with each other and not let them over just become one big flush blushy mess, but is also not just one color at a time. Okay. Our next one is feature. And feature has to do with when you brush, especially a bristly brush like this, you can see that there are bristles in each brush. And the feature is the amount of space between each bristle. So if it's zero, that amount of space is very, very little, if not non-existent. And if it's up all very, very high, that bristle, no, no, get rid of all that mess, bring my resaturation to zero, uh, bring my resaturation up so it's not at zero and you can actually see what I'm brushing, uh, you get a lot more bristles. So this is the same brush at 20 and at four. Very, very, very different looks. And what I should also mention is that zero is going to lag a lot. Uh, if I start painting with this, I'm going to let you know when I pick up my brush and it's going to keep painting because it's lagging. Up. Yep. That was about half my line uh, that it continued to paint without me actually painting it. And it gets worse if it gets bigger. So right here, once again, I'm no longer painting. Not me. Nope, not me. So that does a whole lot of stuff without me painting. So you want to be careful when you make your brush too big and your feature too small that you're just setting yourself up to lag. And what do we say about that? Sad face. We don't want to do that. Again, I switched to the eraser with the M key, back to the brush with the B key. Um, so your feature controls how much bristle effect you have. Also, sometimes you might just want to switch to a brush that has less bristles. Uh, speaking of bristles, we're going to go up to the acrylic menu and we're going to play with a couple of these brushes. And particularly, I'm looking for one that has impasto, like this one. So this one right here has an impasto effect. And you can see that as I'm painting, it's making a very uh, three-dimensional effect with my bristles, which means that as I'm painting, I'm getting a bunch of different effects. If I change my wetness, if I bump my wetness up to 100%, I'm going to have something like this. And if I bump my wetness down to 0%, I have a little something like this. So it's not going to go anywhere. All I'm getting is that hit of the brush on the surface. I'm going to bring it up just a tiny bit so that we can actually see something. But you see how it runs out? I'm grabbing some paper texture, but this controls how much impasto I get as well. If I come up to about 30%, my impasto is much smaller, right? I'm not getting as much physical height to my brush as I did just a little while ago. Viscosity on the other hand, okay, so doo -doo. wetness is going to, on, on a brush, give you the difference between a lot of, a lot of paint moving very far or very little paint moving a very short distance, especially with impasto colors. The viscosity, let's see what happens when I bump that all the way up, getting something like this and bump that all the way down, getting something like that. So if you notice how that blends inside of the stroke that I give it, one of them, the paint tends to move quite a distance and the other one, it doesn't. It has to do, viscosity is how paint moves along a surface and that will, uh, that will mostly become evident when you're making strokes across one another. The grain 
has to do with how much it picks up paper texture and how much it doesn't. That's easier to see in chalk, so we're going to go look at that next. So let's go ahead and go to chalk and crayons. I'm going to use square chalk. So this is what our square chalk looks like. I'm going to reset it to its normal, its normal mode. Gosh, reset. Okay. So again, this can look like this, or you can make it bigger and make it look like that, or you make it bigger and look like that. But it's basically a pattern. This is a paper sensitive texture. So as I move very lightly, you're going to see some paper texture. And if I change that paper, you're going to see a different texture respond, even though they're on the same piece of paper. It never makes sense. I'm going to change my paper texture back because that's going to make me dizzy. And delete it. So we again have resaturation and we have bleed. But the new one we have is grain and jitter. And what grain does is it shows us how much of the grain we're actually going to get when we press. I'm trying to do the same opacity. I'm trying to do the same pressure when I'm doing this, but I am doing it with a pen, so there's going to be some variability. The idea of it being that when you push harder, you don't get as much of the tops of the grains. You really grind the chalk in to the grain of the paper and you get much less of it. So if the grain is really high, it's saying that I'm pressing really, really hard and I'm not getting it in. So if I press all the way hard on this 100% grain, that's what I get. And if I turn it down to zero or 1% and press really, really hard, I get nothing because evidently grain at 0% is zero. If I press really, really hard right here, do you see how this is not solid? This is solid completely and completely solid, no paper texture visible. This has paper texture visible, even in the middle. I actually have some paper texture visible right here in the middle, right here where I pressed the hardest, there is paper texture. It is not just solid. And that's because even with the same pressure, pressing as hard as I can on the tablet, this one is taking a slightly smaller pressure in order to show the grain of the paper more. This one is pushing all the way into the grain. And that's what your grain setup will do for you. Last but not least, in this section, we have jitter. And if you're using uh, an object with jitter, you're going to start with a very straight line looking item. If you bring the jitter up, what you're going to get is, uh, I often call it uh, looking like your brush has had too many cups of coffee. The jitter is going to add variability. And if I just draw a straight up line, that's what it's going to look like. If I try and make that line very solid and continuous pressure, that's what it's going to look like. And you may be asking yourself how, why this is even, why this is even there, or why it's useful, or why it's interesting. And the answer is is pretty simple. It's that it can give you really various texture really quickly. And even this, which is an actual chalky, squarish item can give you some really neat variability really quickly. And that's very useful for us because if we want to make a landscape or a sunrise or a sunset or anything like that, we can add a bunch of these things together and really get a quick use of space with a bunch of different colors. We can also change the size so that that texture becomes different. And once again, since there's a resaturation item, we can take that all the way down and we can start using it like a blender. Oops. And when you use it like a blender, wherever you touch down, that's the color you'll pick up. So if you decide you want to get rid of some of that green, you can get rid of some of that green. If you get just a light, a light color you can do that and so you can add a wide variety of colors and you can see that I'm getting new colors that haven't existed before because I keep touching down in places that are completely new right and I can change my size anytime I like and I can make a really interesting background 
So these textures can make a much more interesting piece of art, and it can even make a certain style of art, which again is also available as a brush. These are the artist brushes. So if you want to make a Van Gogh-like painting, you can paint like a Van Gogh. Or if you want to make a Seurat painting, you can make a Seurat. So you can use these brushes to make very different effects. Again, these also have jitter controls. So you can make something that's a lot more... And also it's choosing an entire palette of colors instead of just a single color for the Surratt brush. In addition to making a very straight line with your jitter low, you can make a very varied line with your jitter very high. Also, you might not have noticed that, but not only is it pressure sensitive, okay, it's also speed sensitive. So the faster I go, the wider those dots are. And this would make a really nice um, way to make stars at night, wouldn't it? Very interesting. Okay. So you have all sorts of different textures. You have all sorts of different items. Uh, probably last but not certainly not least is watercolor. Now you can have digital watercolor, regular watercolor, and re real watercolor. And the real watercolor is the most complicated. And that one is the one that is one of the ones that has to create its own layer. So when you're working with watercolor, one of the things you want to remember is that watercolor has some of its own contextual stuff, and it, uh, which is entirely different, one of which is concentration. So if you're using watercolor and you pick up water and pigment, the more pigment you put in it, the stronger that color will be. And there you can see that those two are going to dry two different things. Setting rate has to do with how fast it dries. And you can see that if it sets a lot quicker, even though these two sides were all the same, uh, were, was all the same color, the setting rate is being lower is gonna make your pigment a lot lower. The setting is not gonna happen as quickly. Weight, low weight, and high weight. We'll show you that your pigment either is very low in weight and is going to sink and really evaporate, or it's very heavy in weight and it's going to sit right on top and be noticed. So a lot of these have to do with how, how much they're viewed or how much they're not viewed or how thick the color is and how thin the color is. You also have grain because this is a paper responsive texture. Your watercolor is actually a very neat um, a very neat a very neat item, but uh, you can watch it dry on your paper and watch it create very watercolor like effects where you have fringes on the edges but it does take up a whole lot of environmental processor speed as you can see it's still drying it's still moving it still has a mind of its own so especially when you're using washes it could take a good long amount of time for that to dry that second wash is still not done Still, well, now it's done. But it wasn't done for a very long time, right? Also, hmm, there should be one that will melt or run, if you will. Perhaps I need to change the settings on that. But uh, uh, watercolors are a bit more difficult because they can't blend as easily. Uh, you don't have the ability to just say blend with watercolors. 
because blenders don't work on that particular layer. But they do have a much more realistic representation of the medium of watercolor. All right, our next, oh, there it is. Do you see it melting? Right there. The reason we couldn't see it before, I think, is probably because it's still melting. And it's still giving us an effect very slowly as it's working. So let's see if this works. Oh. Ooh. So we can watch it dry. So we have lots of different kinds of colors. We have, um, oh, look at that. Look at all of that back there. That's really moving. And this right here is going to change as I talk to you. But um, uh, you have watercolor, which gives you a really good representation of watercolor. It has a really good replication of actual watercolor media to the point where it will drip. You can see this one's starting to drip now. I'm gonna go ahead and make my pointer smaller. But you can see it's starting to drip and you can also see that when I try and move my mouse, I'm getting a really slow response from my computer because right now it's doing hundreds, and I do mean hundreds of calculations on how to make that paint do that. And I'm not doing anything. I'm not touching my computer at all. I'm not doing anything. That paint is reacting to the flow map. That paint is melting in accordance with how much pressure I put on that pen and how much time passes. So if I were to brush on top of that, I would get an interaction with that new paint in accordance with how much that new paint interacts with that. You can see that right here, I have a purple stripe running through my flow map. Uh, of, or running through this this mass of light blue and when that mass of light blue ran over it it also ran that wasn't painted with the same brush but it's getting a similar result because the the watercolor is interacting with the other watercolor like watercolor really does this is kind of this is kind of freaking amazing when you think about it that it's able to do all of these things automatically on its own it's pretty cool so as I watch it do this, um, we're just going to review. You have lots of things. I want to remind you that if there's anything you remember, you should remember one, painter's cool because it make, can mel make melty paint. And two, your resaturation is very important. It's one of the primary reasons that your brush is not painting, and it's one of the most useful resources. Alrighty. That looks like it's about it as that just rise out. And that is where that landed in that wonderful, goopy, drippy mess. So I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. We're gonna start on your next project next time.